Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. We're going to get started. We appreciate your patience. We're, I know we're starting a few minutes late on the, on the evening time. Um, so I, I'm not going to belabor you with too much of an intro, but just wanted to say some uh, kind of thank yous for um, the organizers and our, our co-hosts today. So I'm Shamila Chaudhry. I'm a fellow here at um, Johns Hopkins Science Foreign Policy Institute. and. Um, my background is in American foreign policy in South Asia, and um, this event is being shared in um, its you know, hosts between the American Pakistan Foundation, uh, Foreign Policy Institute, and the East-West Institute, and um, the IDEV program. So thank you so much. Um, and I wanted to just bring in all these different entities because we all kind of look at these issues in uh, overlapping ways, but also in different ways. So I thought the best the best way to tackle a big issue like climate change in megacities was to get lots of different people who are interesting in their own right in the room and have a great conversation around it. So what we'll do is we'll just, I'm going to very briefly tell you about our guest speakers and then we'll uh, get 10 minutes uh, um, from each of them, kind of a scene setter on the issues, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. And I'll try to save more time for all of you rather than myself to ask Q&A. Um, so Tanvi Nagpal, Director of International Development Program here at SAIS, and a very kind of established and recognized expert um, in international development. Um, and then Uzair Yunus is a director at the South Asia Group at Albright Stone Stonebridge, and um, a good friend, and knows everything about the Pakistan economy, warts and all, and nuts and bolts. So if you want to know anything about that, he's the guy to call. Um, and Jennifer Turner uh, from the Wilson Center, she's the director of the China Environment Forum and was recommended to me by several people when I said, who can we talk to about climate change and megacities in China? So you come highly recommended. Thank all right, you. so we're going to start out with Tanvi, who's going to talk to us about mega cities from a big picture perspective and give us kind of a chapeau to the conversation. So please go ahead. Thank you. Um, people are just coming in. Please come and sit their chairs in the front. Um, this is also the third day in a row that I have spent this exact hour in this exact room. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I'm so with you. Do you teach in this room? <laughs> no, we've okay. just had events every day. So yeah. thank you, Jessica, for your third evening in this room. Thank you, Cinnamon, <laughs> for your um, so It seems very familiar. Um, all right, so I'm going to set the stage. I'm going to start making three very basic points. Um, First, that cities are not just passive recipients of the effects of climate change. They actually contribute to climate change, um, which is something you already know. The second is that different cities have very different environmental footprints, um, but the impacts that they suffer are not in direct relation to their footprints. Um, so some of the most vulnerable megacities, as you know, are probably in Asia. Um, and these megacities may not have contributed as much as they are likely to suffer from the impacts of climate change. Um, they, may, may have, may, they may now have very high carbon emissions, but historically, they may not have had those exact same uh, size of their carbon emissions. Um, and also, climate change affects them very differently. Um, the third thing is, and this is a point that's very close to my heart because that's what I really do most of my research and teaching on, is that in developing countries, many of the investments that would reduce human suffering caused or directly related to environmental, um, uh, to climate change events are those that need to be made anyway to improve basic service delivery. Um, um, and these investments and policy changes are not new. The recommendations are not new. They've been on the books, and we've been talking about them for 20 to 30 years already. Um, but where new infrastructure is missing and where those services have not yet been provided, we have a wonderful window of opportunity to do things differently. Um, so those are the sort of three basic points that I wanted to make, um, one about the actual contribution of cities, two, about what they <coughs> suffer, and third, about what are we going to do about this. Um, so just starting with what is a megacity. So a megacity is 10, or more mili million, 10 million or more people who live in a contiguous area. Um, and essentially, when we think of megacities, 
you know, cities are consuming far more than they're actually producing, except for their economic GDP, their per capita that they produce. So in terms of total natural resources that cities are consuming, they're obviously consuming far more than they are producing. Um, and so cities are thus responsible, are held responsible for a lot of sort of GH greenhouse gas emissions and other kinds of gas um, um, pollutant emissions. And the other thing to, to remember is that um, this air pollution has also two kinds of impacts, which we now, IPCC helps us to separate these two out. One are, of course, the impacts that are felt by the people who are living in the cities themselves. And the other are the impacts that are being felt by people contiguous to the city and people living elsewhere, far, far away, because they are adding to the total, total amount of greenhouse gases that are being emitted into the atmosphere. Um, but obviously, while you know IPCC might have focused a lot on on air pollution, um, their issues go beyond air. Um, the part, the one that I'm most passionate about is water. Um, and so clearly, uh, cities consume a lot of water, not just in the water that they drink, not just in the water that they use for um, industrial production or or anything else, but just in the embodied water that they use. So you know, the amount of food that they're eating and the embodied water in it, the amount of plastics that they're using, the just the amount of consumption that cities do, which is, of course, per capita much higher in a developing country than rural areas would be doing. Um, and again, before you think I'm city bashing, I'm a city girl, I love cities, um, <laughs> uh, you know, but cities are also where science and inquiry flourish. And so cities, uh, cities are also places where policy gets made. And so essentially cities are not just sort of the nexus of the creation of the problem and where the problem is being very acutely felt by large numbers of people, but also where the solutions to these problems are going to come. Um, so that's sort of setting it in the context of climate change in the megacity. Um, and the, the last thing that, um, that I want to say is that, you know, different cities are feeling different impacts. And these impacts are, um, you know, the most vulnerable cities are like Dhaka and Jakarta, Manila, Calcutta, Phnom Penh, Ho Chi Minh City, all these lists go on. Um, and these are, some of these are obvious impacts because these cities are threatened by flooding and sea level rise. But that's not the that's not the only hardship that cities are feeling. Karachi's a uh, heat island. You know, temperatures in Pakistan reached 122 degrees last year. Uh, yeah, there's, there's just, there's a lot of other impacts that cities are feeling. Chennai's had prolonged droughts and mm -hmm. floods and, mm -hmm. you know, all of these things. Um, but these, but the cities that we worry most about are cities, or what we consider vulnerable cities, are one, not just because they're exposed to these obvious dangers of sea level rise and that is associated with climate change, but because they're also sensitive to these things. So, you know, cities in Dutch cities are <laughs> by, the, by the sea and they're worried about sea level rise, but the Dutch have dealt with sea level rise for so long that they're not exactly as sensitive to these changes. The second is, is whether they have a capacity to actually adapt, either because they are home to large and growing populations of people, because they're still growing, or because they have leadership and other issues in terms of that are that are preventing adaptation to occur. So vulnerability, as defined by IPCC, is happening along three different um, in three different ways. Um, so that's just sort of my what I wanted to set up in terms of understanding the various dimensions of um, climate change and megacities, um, their contribution, their, their vulnerability, and then their, their capacity to adapt. So thank you, Tanvi. Um, I, I like how you kind of um, characterized megacities as both incubators of bad habits, but also potential solutions and places where you can establish best practice. And so going to Uzair next, Thinking about Karachi, a city where um, multiple kind of functions of the state have collapsed, yet people persist and they they live there and continue to um, do business, and there's a lot of economic life there. How does that 
unfold in a place like Karachi. And you also grew up there. So yeah. I just love even to explain to people, like, what is it like to live in a place that's dealing with climate change and poor kind of state institutions, weak state institutions? Yeah. And the city that you just called is really ugly, right? <laughs> Earlier we were talking. That, and that, that is off the record like, comment. <laughs> 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 I agree I with her. Even, even as someone who, who grew up <laughs> in that city, it is quite and has become quite an ugly city. And, you know, I'll set the stage by... You know, and Shamila mentioned, I, I grew up there, I spent my formative years there, I have friends and family there, and I've seen the city deteriorate and become what it is today, which is a mess, uh, and that's an understatement. Um, and so the way I define my relationship with that city is like someone who had a best friend long time ago, and you know, they, you sort of drifted apart, but you still meet them, and every time you meet them, you're like, holy crap, you got even worse. Like, what <laughs> happened to you? You're going, you're going off the deep end, and you think this you is the bottom, but go. it's even you worse, You let yourself right? go, yeah. Um, and I go there once or twice a year, and so I see that in real time, what's happening there. Um, so I'll just share some data about what that Karachi is. It was 10 million people in 1998. The latest census in 2017 places the population about 15 million. You talk to people in Karachi or political leaders in Karachi, they'll say they undercounted the number of people because there's a development revenue expenditure issue mm -hmm. um, in terms of population. So let's say it's 15 million people, grew by 50% uh, or more in about 20 years. It just got ranked in uh, the least five livable cities in the world. Um, it's just above Dhaka, Tripoli, Damascus, um, Lagos. Yeah, so those are the cities that sort of are in its range. Um, and what's wrong with that city is uh, an issue of governance. So the city does not have a trash management system. It's drowning, literally drowning in trash. Um, it, uh, you know, just recently, if you were watching the news from Karachi, biohazard waste just washed ashore on the sea view, which is where people go to hang out. Um, it was brought to attention just because someone influential happened to tweet about it. Um, it had a plague of flies just last month um, because there was 200 millimeters of rain, and I'll get to the rain pattern point in a bit, but, you know, there was ease and people sacrificed their animals and the city was flooding mm -hmm. and there was no management, so there was a plague of flies and people got really sick out of that. Um, it does not have a mass transit system. And in fact, the infrastructure that's being developed in the city is geared towards more and more cars. So just today, the chief minister of the province of Sindh, which is the uh, state that manages the city, um, announced two more underpasses to construct a signal-free corridor. Now, it does not make sense. We all live in D.C. The Dave Thomas Circle is being made more pedestrian-friendly and more cyclist-friendly. But Karachi, a mega city, is investing scarce government resources in infrastructure for cars that pollute. Um, and so one of the memories I have of the growing up in that city was there's this road called the Michael Archie Bypass, and it's sort of uh, uh, bordered by mangroves. The new U.S. Embassy is there on that road. Um, and you could see the wharf from that city, from that road. Um, and I remember blue skies, watching those wharfs was one of the fondest memories I had on that road. Now you go there, it's a gray sky. The wharf is hazy. And the mangroves is literally dying. You can see it dying in front of you. Mm -hmm. It's because of the output of that city and its pollution and, and the impact it's having on the environment. But still, it remains the economic engine of the country, and it's the only true metropolis. And therefore, it's important that Karachi develop a good habit, because if Pakistan is to deal with climate change and what's coming, um, Karachi has to lead the way. But the problem with the city is that um, the governance is failing. So it's a city that's supposed to experienced 24 inches of uh, sea level rise in the next century. 15, about 1,200 people died in 2015 from the heat wave that came. 200 millimeters of rain just fell in a day. So by, if you want to sort of draw a comparison, in DC from May through July, the wettest uh, months of the year, it rains about 150 millimeters in total. Karachi had 200 millimeters in a day, and it was just flooded. The city was flooded. Raw sewage goes on its beach. There's no management of that. Um, and, you know, there's just uh, Mahi Mehr, who's a friend of mine and a journalist, she just released a long series of reports on the city and its governance, which is just collapsing. And the irony of that situation is that it is governed by the only, quote unquote, progressive political party of the country. It's progressive in name, there's no social progressiveness, no economic justice, nothing in that platform, but they are claiming to be progressive. And this governance failure is just feeding this catastrophe that's happening in real time. 
um, and and the city uh, and its marginalized communities continue to suffer. You know, when when it rains or wind lashes the city, the electric wires come down. People just get electrocuted because they just wa happen to be walking on the street. But there's no lawsuits, no regulatory improvement, none of that. Um, and and so in that situation, it is a it is a catastrophe that is happening that is waiting to happen, but no one's really doing anything about it. And they're actually investing in the wrong policy choices. So the province of Punjab just built a bunch of coal power plants. The coal is imported. It goes to the city of Karachi. So not only do you have smog and pollution from cars, now you have coal dust to deal with on top of everything else. Um, but I think it can get better. And the, 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 there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in that city that can make it a more livable space. The problem is one of governance um, and this continuous lack of um, devolution of power, I would say, to the citizens that live in that city. So it is ruled by people who get most of their votes from outside the city. Karachi itself is not ruled by those who live there. Um, and it continues to feed into this weird public policy conversation in the city where you've had 20 local government legislative changes in the last 10 years or nine years. So that's more than two a year. So you, you can't really govern and prepare a resiliency strategy in a city that is undergoing so much governmental changes year by year. Um, and so as a, someone who grew up there and has family there, my hope is that at some point, you know, they figure out the governance part because only then can you move on and, and prepare the city for what, what's coming um, its way and has already arrived uh, in, in many ways. Mm. <coughs> what I find fascinating about the Karachi example is that in other parts of Pakistan, policies are actually improving the lives of people because of the local government. You know, if you look at pun parts of Punjab, and um, it's actually a very effective model for a country where the, the state at the national level doesn't function very well in serving the people. So in Karachi, it's actually the opposite effect, yep. which is unfortunate. And one thing Uzair said about um, what happens in Karachi becomes an example for the rest of the country. It's something that Jennifer and I talked about on the phone about Beijing. Like what happens in Beijing happens in the rest of the country. And it's not like Las Vegas <laughs> at all. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and you also have work that overlaps with, um, you know, Chennai and India. And so I would love to hear even your thoughts on that. Um, but the, the China example is different because also what happens in China has global implications. Mm -hmm. And so I think that would be something fascinating for us to discuss as well, so please. Okay, so this is, there's a Chinese idiom called uh, Qing Ting Dian Shui, which is like the dragonfly skims the surface. We're all doing that for our cities to make you people dangerous to ask us good questions, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. All right, so, so, right. so, so I kind of like this because it's kind of no PowerPoint, so feeling exposed here, but not. Usually when I talk about Beijing or, or, or any cities in China, I, 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 I have three slides that I like, and I just picture this. You ready for it? Super sexy. The 2007 Beijing Metro map which is three lines, one, two, three. There's a straight line, a little circle, and a little circle on top. That was 2007. And now, 2015, you threw a small bowl of spaghetti against the wall, and you have 17 subway lines. And now by 2020, by next year, it's a bigger bowl of spaghetti, and you have almost 30 subway lines. This is to help you get your brain around what we mean by a mega city. Beijing, 21 million people. And it has seven ring roads, you know, we have our beltway. I'm like, we just have one. Mm -hmm. So they have seven. One day there will be one around Moscow. I mean, this, this city, it's unstoppable. But I like it when people, when you think about these, the roots of the city, the streets, the buildings on top of it. I mean, again, Beijing is at the, the forefront of the fastest urbanization. India, you're barking at our heels mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Pakistan, you're working on it. <laughs> um, so, but that you have to really, Embrace this because I mean, some of you look like you've you've hung out in some. Have you hung out in mega cities? Yeah. All right. So, but a lot of audience. I, I recently gave a talk in Oklahoma, which I had a great time. They hadn't been in mega cities. I had to tell them that I think it was Beijing was close to the population of the whole state. So I mean, it's that oh crazy gosh. kind of stuff like this that blew their minds. But so, but think about with with the infrastructure to build and to run these cities. The, the energy footprint. But a lot of my, my work over the last eight, nine years has been looking at the link between energy and water. Because energy is a very, depending on what you choose, can be very water intensive. And in China, they chose coal. Coal is indeed king. It's the most, one of the most water intensive forms of electricity. And the research that, that I did in my choke point China research that looked at the, 
the water footprint of energy, that we uncovered that of all the electricity used, of all the water used in China, 20% was going to the coal sector. No one knew that in China. And really it was the cities as the drivers of the growth for the cement, the steel, the aluminum, to build these cities, to run these cities, to air condition them if you're north of the Yangtze River, south of the Yangtze River, sorry, no air conditioning centralized. Um, that, that's so, so, so that's why I wanted to get at your point about you know, the footprint of these cities is huge. Now in Beijing, um, back around in 2012, 2013, have you guys heard about the air apocalypses? Mm -hmm. It was plural. Mm -hmm. How can you have more than one? Um, that <laughs> around this time, the PM 2.5 on the air quality, the particulate matter 2.5 on the air quality index was sometimes 1,000. We tie our knickers and knots in DC if it gets over 100, just to give you perspective. And so the mayor of Beijing said at the time, my city is unlivable. Um, and, and so, but what's been fascinating, see, different from Karachi, I have to say, is that in China, one party state, environmental authoritarianism yep. <laughs> has taken the lead. That the war on pollution, it's not just a slogan. I mean, it's been phenomenal. And Beijing is one of the cities that's really pushing some of these rapidly that, like almost overnight, you suddenly had standards on particulate matter 2.5. Cities were required to have real-time monitoring so their citizens could know. You would, new environmental protection law was changed, and then the air pollution, the, m saying that, you know, cities and provinces must meet pollution control laws or you're gonna lose your development funding. I mean, the sticks and the carrots were big and heavy to try to really get these cities back to blue sky. Now, Beijing, anyone go to the Beijing Olympics? I didn't, but I wanted to. For Beijing Olympics, the skies did get kind of blue. Environmental authoritarianism, turned off all the factories, no one could drive their car. It was great. But that gave the public in Beijing and throughout China a taste for it. And they realized, I as an urbanite in my really big mega city, I deserve clean air. And, and, for, and when China decides to go for clean air, like Beijing, because of Beijing Olympics 2008, more renewable energy, more natural gas, the air apocalypse, and also in the prep for the 2020 Olympics, Push it. Now coal-fired power plants, they're no longer in Beijing, and the air is getting cleaner. And, and again, with the amount of money that, that the, the central government throws at cleaning the air and, and thinking and realizing good PR, the, the co-benefit is we're a climate leader. Did you get that memo, people? China is the climate leader. That's what Xi Jinping tells us. So, so now that we are getting, you know, number one in, in, in renewable energy investments, uh, demands that now that by 20, 2030 there can no longer be internal combustion engines in China, no more. F and so that they, they really kind of force, you know, that they're now we're having a lot of electric vehicles, taxis, a lot of, mo all of them and buses in Beijing and major cities are, most all of them are natural gas. The whole shared bike phenomena started in Beijing, low mm -hmm. carbon transport. But the, my last little comment, because I know my 10 minutes are ticking here, um, water. Beijing, I mean, Beijing actually, it, they already, you guys know the term day zero? Mm -hmm. Remember Cape Town? Yeah. There was all that fear, tick, 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 tick. Beijing hit, ba I think they hit day zero for water a decade ago. But being Beijing and having the power, started in like early 2000s, Beijing would suddenly have emergency water transfers. And, and Tianjin suddenly lost their reservoir. Mm -hmm. And then, then, uh, right around for the, the, when the Olympics was announced in 2001 for getting them, putting them on in 2008, the debate on a, the world's largest water transfer project, the South North Water Transfer Project, all opposition was pushed aside. And China has two of their three channels moving water from the Yangtze River North are complete. They move about the equivalent of Lake Erie every year, but that water is also very dirty. So along the Eastern Canal, they have 400 wastewater treatment plants. I keep trying to get information. So what's the energy footprint mm -hmm. of the South North Water Transfer Project? And the answer is, well, Dao, I don't know. <laughs> but that would be an interesting thing to find out. But so to keep Beijing from hitting day zero, which again is climate change. What, is it, what do we use that term? Um, threat multiplier. Mm -hmm. as, as North China gets drier, Beijing will get more desperate. They're already building you know, desalination plants. And, and what's unfortunate, and this is the governance problem in China, environmental authoritarianism, they can do the infrastructure, they can move things quickly, but it's a lot harder to do the messy things like 
increase water prices, promote water conservation, and, 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 then, and here's the other irony that I'll leave you with, is that Beijing, the high and dry city, is also um, face a lot of problems with too much stormwater runoff mm -hmm. because it's so much cement. And I was curious, in Chennai and in Karachi, do you guys also have ma huge flash floods mm -hmm. when yeah. there's rainstorms mm -hmm. oh, yeah. where them, people yeah. drown? Yeah. And it does, but see. Well, Karachi, I mean, Chennai, they're not drowning yeah. per se, but they're, it gets yeah. flooded. Yeah. Yeah. But, in, but in Beijing, about eight years ago, like a dozen people drowned in downtown Beijing. That's crazy. <laughs> And it's like, wow. and it doesn't make any sense. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm going to slowly back away from the microphone. I mean, I think I gave you, did I give you enough information that's to be that's dangerous? That's very helpful. So, but, but I do want to note that we did do a choke point Tamil Nadu project, mm -hmm. which, you know, Ch Chennai, I mean, it's really, I mean, it's, it, yeah, water, well, water's the biggest yeah, problem in I, Chennai. Yeah, wait, and I'm not a Chennai expert, but I think that Chennai, just because I was in Chennai in 2015, 2016, right after the flood. And, uh, you know, when you approach Chennai, it, two months after the, the flood point had actually, a month after the flood had actually kind of subsided, all of Tamil Nadu, so it was the entire state was flooded. Everything was flooded. Um, and it was all brown and just, it was terrible. It was a huge, huge, huge flood. It, Chennai came to a grinding halt. And then to know that two years after that, water. Chennai had this crazy long drought where, mm -hmm. you know, then it was bringing water on, on a train from you know far away and all of its reservoirs were completely dry but that's this is to your point which is chennai gets all of its rain between october november and december and it gets 300 mm you know of rain within that entire month uh, that's the total amount of rain that you know a city would get here in several several months so it gets all of its rain, which is quite typical mm -hmm. of South Asia, in a very short period of time during, mm -hmm. you know, either the winter monsoon or the, or the the tail end of the monsoon season, and and this has always been the case, right? It's always had rain in this part, and what had happened in Chennai was that it had these the system of um, reservoirs and ponds that would capture this rainfall and keep it there, and it would basically smooth your water consumption out yeah. over the other months because it wasn't a shortage of water per se, it was just that it was all falling at the same time. Um, and I think that sort of goes back to this idea of what are we then going to invest in? You know, when you have a flood, people's lives suddenly stop and then the government says, oh, we've got to dr dig the channels, we've really got to deal with flood management. But when cities get progressively drier as they have in India and they have in other parts of the world, people just start knowing, oh, it's going to be the summer months. Oh, we're just going to have water shortages. And people just get kind of used to it. And life just crawls along. And it, it's slower, and it's more miserable, and the poor do suffer, and they pay between one and 52 times more for their tanked water. Yeah. And, you know, they, and sometimes they miss work and all of the things. But they do this every single they're just doing this every day, every year, and the government's not making any changes. One, because you kind of get used to this death by a thousand blows. Um, and two, because a lot of the kinds of investments that you need to do to, to regenerate that water and to rebuild those canals are not visible. They're not, they're, they, they are investments of not just one-time capital expenditure, but of making sure that your operational expenditure is there, changing the water pricing, doing the hard policy work. It's much easier to say, oh, we got flooded, next year we're going to clean all our drains. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, just, it's just easier. And just on the water point, like I'll give a couple of examples. Like my home is one of the few in my neighborhood where I grew up that still gets water. A lot of times it's contaminated with sewage water, um, mm -hmm. which is another big problem. So. We did a test of the water, and you, it's contaminated with things like E. coli. Mm -hmm. You can't, like, it's not fit for consumption. Mm -hmm. But at least we get water. There are people I know that walk 10 to 15 kilometers in Karachi a day just to get water. There's like a couple of water fountains, one we have outside our home. People come from like 10 kilometers, they line up at 6 a.m. just to fill up four gallons of water and then go home. Sometimes you shut off water, there's no water. They'll come at 9 p.m., they'll come at 10 p.m., they'll knock on your door and like, can I please have some water? There's not a single drop of water. 
There are elite parts of the city where there is no water. You have to buy tankers to come in. Again, the governance problem in Karachi is on top of the fact that it's running out of water, there's a water mafia mm -hmm. yep. that controls the hydrants up top and then they sell privately and everyone's involved from like the government politicians, crime mafia, they're all involved in this making a ton of money and there's no governance on what happens uh, with this water. And then the same thing happens. Karachi has strong water drains built by the British. They still work. Like that's the amazing part is that those <laughs> strong water drains still work. They're over 100 years old, but they're getting choked because of plastic. So when the rains come, this plastic just chokes everything. No one's cleaned up those drains in decades. And all of this clean water that should I ideally be captured mixes with sewage, and then you lose everything. And then you wonder a month later, like, why is there no water in the city? And it's like, well, because you didn't set up an infrastructure, or when you set up, build a new road, you didn't pr uh, put money aside for a stormwater drain that would capture that water. It just mixes with sewage, and so you lose all of it. So we, you all gave a good sense of kind of a very localized context of megacities and climate change. And when Jennifer was talking about China and coal power, you know, we've talked about this before as well. You know, China isn't producing coal power at home anymore, but they are sending it to Pakistan and yeah, not just yes. <laughs> and elsewhere. Why not spread the wealth? Uh, yeah, and you know, the Pakistanis say, well, we haven't contributed to the climate change disaster enough, so we're going to, you know, we're going to do our part. Uh, kind of half joking, but um, and they desperately need to improve their um, kind of I'm, power situation. I mean, in Pakistan isn't something like. 33% of the people don't have electricity. Yeah, about 30%, yeah. And, and, and so, and so when Ch you guys have heard about the Belt and Road Initiative, right, the Chinese investing overseas. And what's, what's really sad is that while China at home, I mean, yes, they, they've been, they have been lowering their CO2 emissions, mm -hmm. putting in lots of renewables, and yes, big, really pushing energy efficiency. But on the coal side, China's fleet, they have the, most efficient fleet of ultra supercritical coal fired power plants. There's no coal fired power plant in the US that could meet the Chinese standards for being efficient, just so you know. Super clean. But when they go overseas, um, it's really like the old coal fired power plants. Because the, there's all these engineers and there's the actual, sometimes the physical plants mm -hmm. get dismantled and then yeah. moved to Pakistan mm -hmm. or whatever. And so it's, it's kind of a jobs initiative mm -hmm. for China. But at the same time, the Chinese, you know, they go to the countries and they say, well, what do you want? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and the Americans will go in and the Japanese come in and there's a lot of paperwork. And it's, I've, I've talked to people, Center for American yeah. Progress has done some cool studies looking in Southeast Asia, and I think also in yeah. South and, Cent and, and Middle East, looking at like what are the dynamics of just the coal, mm -hmm. coal fire power plant construction. The Chinese win because they're cheaper and they're fast. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they're just putting, and, 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 and and you guys just want electricity. They, they build yeah. it. And like it's, it's yeah. ridiculous because, I, I mean, the Chinese will build whatever you ask them to build. It's like it's your job to develop a plan for what you want. So it's ridiculous to ship a thousand kilometers inland into the Punjab, a coal power plant, that there is no coal supply there. Mm -hmm. So it has to be imported into Karachi and then goes on open railroads through the agricultural belt of the country and then burn it there. And then, oh, by the way, you wake up in December and you can't, you can't go out of in Lahore. Yeah. because you're literally choking. Um, and it's not like Lahore has gone from having really nice foggy weather in the winter to having smog. And like people just don't realize, like I had a friend in Karachi and in Lahore whose son like basically one day looked at some old pictures and said, Daddy, look, blue skies. He had never seen a blue sky. I didn't see a blue sky. I was just in Karachi for 15 days. I saw a blue sky one day after it rained. That's it. And there's no conversation on what do we need to do to clean up the air or the water or anything else. Well, is there any conversation about the environmental impact of the CPEC initiative in particular, the coal power plants? Or uh, not really. People are trying to talk about like the smog and like pollution and something needs to be done about this. But there, it's not reached a point uh, where it's any policy initiative or like a CPEC criticism has crept in. What's happened though is like particularly in like places like Lahore, is that now, because of the air quality, the elite and the non-elite are both suffering. So it's mm -hmm. leading to a conversation because now it doesn't matter, like, you know, dirty water is a poor person's problem, the rich person can buy mineral water, it's fine. But you can't buy clean air. I mean, you can put filters in your home, but you gotta go out at some point, But, but right? see, that's, that's what happened in China. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the 2012-2013, the and that, that there was, you know, the great equalizer, and 
and the government realized that this was, you know, the Communist Party's one, one little strength of their platform is to provide economic development. And, and the facts are there that, you know, 1.6 million people die early every year in China because of air pollution. Mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, and I'm sure we've got equally yeah. scary stats in India, but that, it, that, but that in China, you know, that it's, 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 you know, but they've also seen this, and you, you, hint, you talked about it in your opening remarks, that, that this is an opportunity for China to be an innovator, to make money. I mean, the fact that they have all these low carbon, they've got these bullet trains. They're mm -hmm. uh, pushing electric vehicles, uh, you know, largest installed solar panels, and, and it just, and so, and they see that, that these kinds of, and also trying to work on, actually, for on the water side, more energy efficient desalination, mm -hmm. because they're seeing this as like future markets. But, but ultimately, like, but, but the immediate challenge, though, is that the fact that the Belt and Road Initiative, 80% of the elect energy that they're, they're, they're building overseas, it's coal mm -hmm. and oil. Yep. And, it's, and they've basically nullified the advances. They made, they, they'd, they've met their commitments for the Paris Agreement, mm -hmm. and now they're nullifying it, if you count. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, but I just wanted to take us back to sort of megacities and this whole idea of megacities in the idea, in the time of climate change mm -hmm. because and there's something I said also and you've definitely alluded to is whether this is climate change or not climate change public service delivery and city management are important and have been important and have been lacking. They're just much more acutely important in this particular time in certain cities. The idea is and I think this is something that's up for debate, is to what extent should city managers or, or people uh, try to reframe the conversation in terms of a long-term you know, life change or changing your city's priorities, and how much should they be looking at, well, my life's miserable right now? Um, and I think that that kind of a framing is just I don't hear it very much. And I think the reason I don't hear it very much is because this is their daily troubles. One, they're getting sort of this, they're like the, you know, when you, whatever, the frog boiling in the water, you're boiling it slowly. And so they're just getting kind of adapting themselves to it. Um, and because the infrastructure was missing to begin with, right? So the, the, I think the more interesting conversations that are happening in these cities are, when we have to retrofit in infrastructure, when we have to build new infrastructure, when we have to plan new roads, when we're looking at our, our public transport systems, our, uh, uh, how are we going to do those investments now, right? And I think what I'm hearing from you is that in Karachi, that conversation can't be even had because you need a government in order to, and a functioning government in order to have yeah. that conversation. In Chennai, that conversation can be had, right? Because the Tamil Nadu government has had a climate um, change plan on its books for a long time. In fact, it just redid its climate change plan. Um, and it's got goals, very, very, very particular specific goals about its use of non-fossil fuels, about its own em em emission reduction, about sequestration that it is going to do, the state by itself, about you know, time-bound goals that it has established for itself. And the, plan, the issue really is you know, who's, who's going to hold them accountable, mm -hmm. um, how are public service delivery that are acute and immediate needs going to be uh, prioritized or in, in the context of this larger plan? Um, and then when progress is slowing down and when you're feeling like you're three steps forward and four steps back, then how are you going to re, you know, basically realign and recalibrate and get back on the wagon? Mm -hmm. Because so many of the things that we can talk about, groundwater recharge, rainwater harvesting, all of this is, this is not new, right, for, mm -hmm. for cities in India or anywhere. Um, Bang Bangalore, I just spoke to people in Chennai yesterday because I wanted to be current on my information, mm -hmm. but Bangalore essentially had uh, a law on the books about all new buildings needing to be built with rainwater harvesting. Mm -hmm. And it does exist. And it created and cleaned up a whole number of tanks. And actually, for a couple of years, 
in 2011 or so, the actual groundwater level started to go up in Bangalore. Hmm. Right, uh, uh, no, in Chennai. And then uh, it stopped again because, you know, then they weren't maintaining those tanks and the, nobody cared about it anymore. And so it, the part of it is how do you course correct? How do you hmm. constantly course correct and remind people that, you know, these solutions are not just for immediately solving your problems, but they're really, really necessary for the long term. So how, how much of that planned development was, um, you know, triggered by the state and how much of it was non-state actors or public pressure because of lack of service delivery? Like what's the, I mean, what are the drivers of that? So in Tamil Nadu, I think that it was probably a combination of just everybody talking about climate change and the fact that India is very clearly on the map of, you know, mm -hmm. e extreme shortages. I mean, WRI just did this big amazing study and on, on uh, aqueduct on, you know, how Indian cities are about to run out of water. But again, the Niti Aayog in India did a similar study yeah. two years ago and said, you've got 21 cities in India that are going to run out of water in 2020. Mm -hmm. So these are not things, these are things we've been talking about for a really, really long time. Mm -hmm. The central government knows it. The state government knows it. The city managers definitely know it and mm -hmm. feel it. Um, there is an environmental constituency in India. The, the Actually, the law, the courts, the Supreme Court has been a huge part of, of environmental action in India. The, the Green Tribunal? Yeah. Oh, just the Supreme Court. The Supreme even. Court yeah. and the Green Tribunal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think that there's, there's all of these that have sort of come together, but, but you know, the normal person on the road mm -hmm. is, is, wants there to be water tomorrow mm -hmm. and doesn't want to pay more for water. I mean, even, even talking about tanker water, yeah. So tanker water costs three to five times as much in Chennai than tap water, or maybe more sometimes, 10, maybe 12. And it's still not expensive enough. It's still not priced as it should be. I was in Chennai in the middle of the drought, literally in the middle of the drought, walked into my hotel, fully expected there to be a bucket in the hotel, like right? not a five-star hotel. Bucket, I expected a bucket, and you know that's how you're gonna take a bath, there's no water. Best shower pressure I had had in five weeks. <laughs> OK? The pool in this four-star hotel was being clean in the morning. I'm like, there's no water in this city. Why is the pool filled? It was uh, shocking to me. I was, you know, it was up. And I, I spoke to people. And they said, oh, yeah, we live in this, you know, in this complex of apartments. And uh, all the children are swimming. Uh, in the meantime, Chennai had declared day zero. There was no water in Chennai. The water was all being trucked in. Trucks were taking 10,000 tanker trips a day, a day into Chennai. Wow. The train was going to get inaugurated the next week with great bells and whistles of you know the train coming in three times a day with <laughs> bringing water in. Chennai was supplying at that point 30% of what it needed in a day to its citizens. Um, so, so that's what I'm saying is that the pricing, <coughs> conservation have just are those mm. those did not have not mm. really really taken hold. I mean, Cape Town averted day zero largely because it dropped its its consumption of water through conservation mm. by thirty to fifty percent within three weeks. It was, and then it rained. Right? And so it was great that it rained. Mother Nature rewarded. They yeah. should have been rewarded so, with rain, so you know? You've, you've <laughs> given us a lot to think about. So let's open it up for questions. Uh, we've got about 20, 25 minutes for questions. So um, we have mics and introduce yourself and your affiliation. And let's go to Cinnamon first, please. Um, thank you. I'm Cinnamon Dornsife. I'm with the International Development Program and also with the Foreign Policy Institute. So thank you all. That was great. Really stimulating. And um, Tanvi, I've, I've got a question for you. I want you to answer your own question that you asked about, we need course corrections. Mm -hmm. So how would a government in Chennai uh, go about putting in place a, a, a system that is accountable to citizens for course corrections. And maybe to move over to Karachi and just say, even though it's really, you've really painted a picture of broken governance, what would be 
what would be your first steps um, for course correction there? And then maybe to move over to um, Jennifer and say, okay, Beijing, you know, besides environmental authoritarianism, which is <laughs> not so transferable to other settings, um, is there something more universal that you would recommend for course correction? Okay, so let make a note of the question. Let's just take a couple of more questions and then we can. Thank you very much. I'm uh, with UNESCO. We have a task force. And I have two questions. One, how about indoor air pollution? According to the World Bank, the five trillion cost of pollution, most of it is due to indoor air pollution, the impact on cost and productivity. Uh, among the first studies I'm transnational conducted in France, the monetary cost, annual cost in 2014, 2004, of indoor air uh, pollution in France was over 20 billion euro, so very okay. high. Um, so how do you address the World Health Organization confirmed those studies? Most of the studies are very recent, and the impact is huge. Would you, and how would you advise a coordinated policy to measure, correct, and monitor indoor air quality? Okay, thank you, thank you. And what, we'll take one more. Um, Fatima. Hi, my name is Fatma. Um, thank you for your talk. My question is really, in a few days, all of these megacities will be represented at UNGA, um, at the UN General Assembly, um, and the, um, you know, the state leaders will be representing what they're doing on climate change in each of these countries. And so I'm just curious, you've mentioned a lot of the barriers, because it seems a lot that the government, government is the barrier to a lot of these um, mega cities and state local um, you know infrastructure um, so I'm curious to know what are what is the role of industry in these mega cities um, can they play a part um, and and what is that what is that role and then can you also speak to climate change literacy in these mega cities um, I think mm -hmm. a lot of you touched on it but what can these um, local um, municipalities do to um, kind of work on the climate change literacy of these folks? Okay, great question. So the first one on course correction, second one on indoor, the cost of indoor air pollution, mm -hmm. and then uh, role of industry and climate change literacy. So so that's a tough, tough, tough question, Cinnamon, but I wouldn't expect any less So from you. Um, <laughs> that's why we have her in the front row. Right, of course. <laughs> um, and I think that, so I always say, you know, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Um, and it, it's true. Um, and I, you know, in one, in some senses, um, I think what's going to be happening in Chennai or in Delhi after the air pollution disasters that have happened every single winter um, is this sense of a, a, a group of interested and educated and concerned citizens and the government coming together and creating a, a kind of a movement. So it's, you know, in India, it's the media and the courts and um, environmental NGOs who essentially refuse to be quietened down. And I think their role has been really important in, in making sure that the government is constantly heeding their, um, their cry, essentially, to, to, to change things. The other thing I think is that the government will be threatened. Elections will happen, right? And, and making sure that you're timing your work, your policy work, your um, advocacy work at a time when these things are in, become, can be put on the agenda again and again and again so that you elect people who are aware of them and who are willing to and can be held responsible for working on the agenda that they agreed to in their in their election campaigns, will do something for the city. The other thing is that I really believe that city authorities, when the devolution happens to city authorities and they have the financial means and they have the independence of, you, of fixing their taxes, their tariffs, their collection of their funds correct properly, they are much more likely to course correct 
than at a national level, which is just difficult to do in India. You know, in India, uh, our prime minister has one new campaign a day, right? So now India has water. India is, has no open defecation. I mean, because he says it, it's true, <laughs> right? Whereas in a city, you, a city manager uh, can be held responsible and say, no, it's not true. Look, I'm lining up here. I, I don't have water, you know? So I think part of this is just sort of understanding what is the role of the city and its management and then course correcting through holding the government responsible for what it has to do, holding it re businesses responsible for they, what they promised to do, holding governments responsible for what they said businesses had to do. I mean, part of what the problem in Chennai has been is that when ponds dried up, instead of digging them up and protecting them till the next rainfall, they got backfilled, and the government sold licenses to builders to build on top of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, because it's really, really valuable land in the middle of the city, right? So understanding and holding then your municipal commission responsible for not doing that because you are there and you are the one who notices that the pond is being filled, it's really important. I know I haven't given you exact, but there are citizen scorecards in places that have been used very effectively. Um, and, and people... People have uh, protected parks by literally creating barriers around them. So, you know, green spaces are protected very, very, very passionately by people um, in all kinds of cities. So I do think that there is there's a way, and education, environmental education and climate change education is really, really, really key to this because we are all frogs being boiled in the water. So we just think it's a way of our life. Do do either of you want to address Cinnamon's question? Um, well, yeah, I want to make sure, you know, in a short talk, I don't want, don't want you to believe that, you know, Beijing's authoritarianism, you know, the government's author environmental authoritarianism does everything. But what it does do is, that, I mean, it, you have to admit, it's a one-party state, and that, and then also that, um, kind of linked to the second question, most industries are state-owned enterprises. That kind of answers half that question. But, um, but by the government prior, the central government prioritizing, you know, Air pollution, water pollution, addressing climate—that has opened. That's for the last 30 years. It's opened up a lot of political uh, political space for. There's a lot of international NGOs, mm -hmm. think tanks, and mm -hmm. foundations. I mean, the Energy Foundation has an office in in Beijing, and that and that a lot of these international organizations, a lot of U.S., have been building the capacity of government researchers, NGOs. Uh, even companies to address some of the environmental problems. You look at a lot of the the, the air pollution control laws, the energy efficiency, the clean, the renewable energy laws. They have the fingerprints of a lot of international organizations. So, so it's you know Beijing just didn't go it alone, but that this willingness, a little bit less now under Xi Jinping, to work, you know, with you know, I mean, like WRI, you mentioned mm -hmm. them. they they have an office in China, and Natural Resources Defense Council not only works on clean energy, but has been working on public participation and helping to push on public mm -hmm. interest lawsuits on environment. So there's, I mean, keep in mind, I, I direct the China Environment Forum, right? I have a smile on my face. Because I, cause I've seen there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of movers and shakers, again, not just at the government level, but in the research and the NGOs. And so, and they're the ones that are really kind of ultimately together driving this change. And it can be apolitical in those countries. Whereas here we think of climate change and denial and no. you know taking away LED standards, LED standards yeah. and everything. There, I think, sort of there can be an apolitical agreement that that we need to do something. I haven't. I don't think that climate change or clean water or heat or whatever are politicized in India. Like everybody agrees about yeah. <laughs> you know that there is a problem. Well, on governance, I'll, like in a place like Karachi, right, there's just so much low-hanging fruit that if you just fix the governance problem, it's a really hard problem to fix. But if you just give people the authority at the devolution at the local level, like Karachi does not have a landfill site. But no one really cares about developing one because it's just a garbage dump in a shanty town on the outskirts of the city. They don't have any political power, so obviously they're not going to say legislate and clean up this place and develop a proper site. 
Um, but when you do devolve power to people, I agree that, you know, then all sorts of other incentives take over about related to your constituents who are directly going to be outside your door every day. It, that doesn't happen in Karachi. So you have, and then it creates perverse incentives. So Karachi had a clean Karachi drive for the last month. It's being led by the federal minister for ports and shipping who happens to be a le legislative member from Karachi. But that's not the job of a sh ports and shipping minister to lead a clean city campaign, right? But you don't have governance, so he ends up doing it, and he tries to get benefit out of it, but it becomes all of a sudden really weird. So now there's a term in local media called trash politics. That's what's going on in <laughs> Karachi for the last month. It's called literally, like all the different parties are trying to point fingers at each other and say, your trash is creating flies and you're not dumping it properly, et cetera, et cetera. But if you had local government, it would just be the union council or the district uh, council member doing it for them. Um, on the industry, I think that's, in, in, in especially in places like India, Pakistan, a huge role, right? Now, I'll just use plastics as an example. Unilever PNG, they sell these little sachets all over the country. And talking about climate change education, they have networks that, you know, suppliers at the very grassroots level that sell these things. One, they shouldn't be selling this because it's, it's, there's no plastic collection. So this just ends up out there. Um, and two, if they were to take it on as part of their impact strategy framework, they could educate the distributor at the local level and inform people why single-use plastic is bad, that we're replacing single-use plastic with more recyclable stuff, maybe even use their um, distribution network to collect and recycle some of these materials that they're actually producing. But And I think they have a huge role to play. But again, there's not a lot of, at least in the case of places like Pakistan, there's not a lot of like local push and demand from the people that you need to fix this. Um, so you have campaigns, you know, speaking of your point on like state leaders, like billion tree tsunami, and we're going to plant trees and combat climate change. Yeah, you can do that, but it does. there's a lot more that needs to be done in that space. Or like Islamabad just had a ban on single-use plastic. So before coming here, this is like hilarious. They said no more single-use plastic, did not plan or do anything around it, right? And my question was, well, what will be the replacement when you go to shop in the store for the single-use plastic? Lo and behold, the law says no single-use plastic. So people now, for their vegetables and fruits, are putting them in single-use plastic nets because that's not a shopping bag. Therefore, it's allowed. Therefore, all the markets are now selling this. And, like, you have shopping nets being sold because it's like, you should have thought this through. Like, you don't need to push this in a couple of weeks. Think through how you're going to first educate people and then push for change. And that just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, does anyone want to take the question on the cost of indoor air pollution? But, but and when you, I'd maybe to clarify, sure. for, for indoor air pollution, are you referring to the, everything from like the, the chemicals that are being emitted from carpets and? I guess I wasn't, I'm not yeah. an indoor air I mean, I, the only thing I know is that, that I mean, indoor air pollution is obviously a big problem. I just don't know how, I'm trying to figure out oh, how can I can relate stove, it to, yeah, cook, cook stoves. The cook stove issue, maybe, is that referring to the indoor no, cook uh, stoves? My question is for, like, um, no, and whether you believe or not in climate change, uh, today, the mitigation of the impact of climate change can be addressed to largest extent by addressing the impact and cost of indoor air pollution. Huh. Most of the studies have been conducted for outdoor air pollution, and recently a study conducted for indoor air pollution. Hmm. There's a uh, yeah. department at Harvard who completed the studies two years ago, uh, what is called LC building. So I'm very surprised that such an issue we talk about, whether you believe in climate change, was, or whether uh, a girl, a uh, teenager crossing the Atlantic, is such a destruction, possessive destruction. Uh, even those who believe don't do what they should do. Today, we have to reduce the number of deaths due to indoor air pollution, which amounts to 3 million worldwide. Have to address those issues. This is quantitative. There are some solutions. Mm. Green building did not address the issue. On the contrary, sometimes they amplify the indoor pollution. Yeah, I'm just so not an expert on the issue. Yeah, yeah, maybe we. But yeah, yeah. Has yeah. to be what? serious about climate change. Yeah. Can you add here? Sure so, so I think what you're referring to is burning of biomass uh, for indoor cooking and heating. 
mostly in rural, rural areas. Yeah. 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 Mm. So yeah. mega city problem. And in yeah. terms of uh, 60% of the emissions in some of these South Asian countries are from uh, burning off biomass. biomass. Yeah. Right. And so that is an important concern. So the argument people make is that if people have access to electricity uh, for energy, then they won't be burning that. So, but in generally in discussions on climate change, people who have no connections or have no access to electricity are not even in the discussion space. So there are, within Pakistan I know, that 40% people would not have any source of electricity um, in the foreseeable future. Um, so that's not what um, Thank you. Is, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm, I'm Wadu Khan. I'm with uh, Earth Science Foundation. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for answering yeah, that question. Thank you. We should have you up here. <laughs> 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 okay, so next time. This, this whole panel could be a semester long course, by the way. I mean, there's a lot to. Okay, so we have just 10 minutes, so we can do another round of quick questions. Um, wait for the mic, please. Uh, so we know, oh, uh, Mike Spiechen, uh, formerly of the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, we know that uh, about 39% of all carbon emissions come from the building sector, 28% in operations, and about 11% embodied energy, that's construction. A lot of that comes from cement and from steel production. Can you talk at all, and this will be sort of open-ended, about your views on the evolution of population and the built environment within cities and the implications for energy emissions and any of the other sectors that you see major intersections with? Okay, hold that, hold those yeah. thoughts. Go ahead. Thank you. We'll take another run. Fareed Zaman, Sai Salam, and currently um, I'm with the Partnership for a Secure America. So my question is, because I was an aid worker in Pakistan uh, for three years before um, studying at SAIS, and I, I remember there was the 18th Amendment to the Constitution, which was you know for devolution, uh, devolving power from the national to the mm -hmm. uh, provincial levels. Yeah. And what uh, I was wondering, you know, since you mentioned devolution, you know, uh, like how that could be a solution, um, what prospect is there, and what developments, um, like in South Asia, but then also. Uh, any developments follow up to following up to the um, in follow up to the the Eighteenth Amendment? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. uh, I was wondering if you can comment yeah. on that, and if there's something I don't know. Uh, now we spoke about uh, also um, with respect to China that there's like environmental authoritarianism. That's now I guess going to be a new hashtag. Um, <laughs> but uh, if there is um, if there is some if there is an avenue for that there. All right, one more question, and if there is one, go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is Sohail. I'm currently <laughs> with the World Bank. Uh, I live, also lived in Chennai for three years, and I have many friends and some family there, so this is a personal issue for me. Uh, my question is about political incentives uh, surrounding water management and uh, also air quality to some extent, but especially water management in Chennai. Uh, as the water crisis has escalated, what's happened is that the crisis in some sense has metastasized, where Chennai is bringing in tankers of water from other distressed regions mm -hmm. in the Tamil Nadu hinterland. And these short-term solutions feed directly into short-term political incentives as well. So do you have any suggestions, or perhaps from the uh, Pakistani context as well, how uh, the incentives can be shifted to a long term so that, as you mentioned, the hard work can be done, you know, desilting the uh, reservoirs and so on and so forth. Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, on the carbon emissions and cement steel part, I mean, you're right, like that's a big, big problem. And in a place like Karachi, where there is no regulatory authority that looks at the impact, right? There's just not even data. Um, forget about policy that sort of deals with the issue. Like in my neighborhood, about a dozen new high rises have gone up, like 15, 16 story high rises, but there is no uh, policy to say this, these are the materials you should use, these are, this is what you shouldn't use, et cetera, et cetera. So that conversation, even at the national level, in terms of building standards or even uh, emission standards for vehicles, et cetera, are just, it's just not happening. So you, again, it's low hanging fruit, like you can at least start doing something about this from a policy perspective um, in the short term. The 18th Amendment was like a classic case of like power was devolved to the provinces 
and they were mandated constitutionally to devolve power to the cities and other towns and districts. But no one wants to devolve power at that lower level, particularly in the province of Sindh in, in a place like Karachi, because the politics is such that Karachi's like popular party is one and the party that rules over Sindh is another, so they don't want to give up that power. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, 90% of tax revenues for the province of Sindh come from um, the city of Karachi, so they, they don't want to give that power up because they would lose access to that money. But there have been... Uh, KPK, uh, Punjab have done their own uh, attempt, made their own attempt at local government. The PTI just did its own new thing in Punjab. And it's like this running experiment without any evidence-based policy making. So every new government that comes tries a new form of local government. So since Musharraf 2002 onwards, this is the third sort of local government test that's going on at the city level in Pakistan. And it's just not working because everyone tries to tinker at the margins with it. Um, so it, it's just an ongoing problem that not, that's not being addressed. Mm. You want to talk about building? Yeah, well, your, your yeah. question, a, a few couple of years ago I had, after there was an announcement in Beijing, I had a meeting that was called, um, how many light bulbs does it take to change China? Kind of Is that because, like, again, mm. I don't want, I don't want, I, maybe I kind of overstate, but it's, it's, a, it's a cool example of, you know, environmental authoritarianism can work with simple things. When Beijing said, only LED light bulbs, boom. I mean, it was amazing how they could, you know, they do these things overnight, but at the same time, they're still building lots of buildings. The embedded energy use is gigantic. But, um, but in China, um, there's, you know, um, of course, you know, LEED is there. They have their own China LEED. Um, what's kind of neat, there's been some, there's been, there's a, as in terms of like, I want to not talk about government space, there's a, a foundation that was created by a whole bunch of small and medium-sized kind of um, real estate companies, and you know, building companies, and they've actually together devised a green building material certification program because they they realize that there's there's a lot that you know there's so many you know moles that you can whack to try to fix these some of the challenges in Chinese cities in terms of energy use, but they felt that that to really try to to to, to green these supply chains, to making sure that, that back at the cement plant that things were being, you know, that they were more energy efficient. And the, I know the idea of green cement is, seems counterintuitive. But, but I mean, there, it's been kind of encouraging to see those kinds of, kinds of developments in China. That, so I, I want to make sure you see that not everything is top down, but there's been a lot of the business sector, kind of your question with the inventory uh, uh, industry, that, that we are seeing some industry players kind of stepping forward to try to try to be cleaner and greener. Yeah. I mean, the only, and I'm not an expert on this at all, but I think that um, there are two problems in when you look at India. One is that some people have said that actually one of the, you know, Indian cities are pretty dense. There are a lot of people who live there, but they're quite flat. So their building standards <laughs> are high to kind of, are are not very good. So um, India, Delhi, for instance, you know, nothing can be taller than a certain height. And that has actually created lots of sort of disincentives to be able to regulate how buildings are actually built. So every single, every single office building, every single household just essentially haphazardly adds on whatever it needs to add on to its house. Um, so part of it is that there just hasn't been sort of a housing code that has kept up with the demands and the needs of the city's growth itself. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And the second thing is that, uh, at least in India, I know now that there's a huge push to have affordable and green <coughs> building materials just because the cost of cement has to keep rising. India has essentially mined out all of its riverbeds. So sand is a huge shortage in India at this mm -hmm. point. Um, it's a global global shortage. Mm -hmm. It's a global shortage. Yeah. 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 There's a book yeah. called, um, yeah, we had the, uh, not, did you read Better that guy's book about yeah. in the world in a grain? Yeah, or so, mm. it, and I've just Or watched his TED talk. Yeah, I've, I've, I, I just w looked at the Nat Geo article about it, but, <laughs> but I just know that essentially um, there's a mafia. There's like, there's a water mafia, there's a sand mafia in India, just because there's such a huge shortage of, of sand for, um, to, to, to mm. actually make, you know, concrete and do mm. building. Um, on the other hand, if you think about it, there is a huge need for housing in India at the same time. So we are, again, at that sort of inflection point of, OK, people are getting wealthier. They need better housing. 
are we going to leapfrog and not provide them housing in the same way that we provided housing in this country? Mm. You know, is this a, is this this opportunity point where we can now design better and and for the next century? Because clearly, people need better housing. You can't deny them that. Um, so there's there, you're absolutely right. And again, this brings me to this point of you know, different mega cities all over the world are at different parts of their need. While we can look at green buildings and passive heating and. Uh, certainly Singapore should be looking at it. I mean, you know, and uh, all these other richer places mm -hmm. in the world should be looking at it. Is it, are those the top of the concerns for, for a, a medium to large city in India? Um, and I'm not sure that that's really the top of their concern, but it, you know, it should be. They should be thinking yeah. about it because they're heading in that direction. So, so it's a really valid point and, and I know people are working on it, but it's probably not getting the attention it deserves, mm. you know? So uh, thank you very much for those wonderful kind of answers and your analysis. Um, as a final point, you know, the, I, I had a very selfish reason for doing, you know, wanting to do this conversation, which was, you know, I wanted to kind of pull these, these cities that people look at kind of individually out of their localized context by evaluating the local, but mm -hmm. also pull them out of the context so that we could see these similarities across all of them. Um, not, you know, and we're not trying to compare apples and oranges here or just hunt for similarities, but I do think that there are some common threads across all three of them, um, which um, really put them in a much more global context. Mm -hmm. And I think that's needed if we're, try if we're gonna work on what the solutions are. You know, and then clearly there's governance issues there's you know, two cases of where there are mafias, and then there's environmental Amazing. authoritarianism, which is one big yeah. mafia, I guess you could say. No, <laughs> no that's not. I, the but, state but of but China is not a mafia. But, 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 <laughs> but, but that, you know, but I hate to wait a cri waste a crisis. I mean, in, in some ways, I mean, China, they they accelerated their addressing. You know, they they need to clean the air and yeah. the water because the people are unhappy. I mean, yeah. we don't always, yeah. you know, I mean, the, yeah. the public in China. I mean, they're the, don't ignore them. You know, it's not just Beijing. Right. The pressure from the public, because I mean, they they they're dying. Yeah. You know, they're getting it, sick. And then there's yeah. this idea of this contract between the people and the state, where in Karachi it sounds like it's collapsed essentially, and yeah. uh, you know, in Beijing it sounds like it's working yeah. mm -hmm. um, so far. So I think there's still a lot of interesting issues to unpack here, and um, hopefully we can continue the conversation. But I wanted to thank the three of you for this, and thank you for all your wonderful questions. Um, thank you to our um, co-hosts, East West Institute, IDEV, American Pakistan Foundation, Foreign Policy Institute. Thanks. Have a good night, everyone. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.